Uh, Stu, thank you very much. And let me thank all of you uh, for being here. This is a great opportunity for me to share some perspectives uh, from uh, uh, Lesotho. Uh, these have some, some interesting uh, uh, messages for anyone who's looking into uh, rule of law and as it impacts uh, the trajectory of countries to, uh, uh, to progress. Uh, because of very tight schedules, I wasn't, I wasn't able to be here earlier, but I, I, I'm almost certain uh, some of the issues or some of the things you discussed uh, would have been the usefulness and the value of uh, uh, rule of law, uh, the utility of rule of law to restrain and protect uh, people and, and uh, business from their own governments. Uh, the role of uh, rule of law in creating predictable and peaceful means of uh, resolving uh, issues. And, and, and the certainty that uh, rule of law provides in the ecosystem of investment and uh, uh, consumption. And the capacity of uh, economic agents to take their own decisions uh, for the present and for the, uh, for the future. Now, you, you begin to appreciate rule of law much more when you don't have it. And today I'm going to share with you uh, uh, two perspectives. One, when you have uh, a, uh, a rule of law vacuum and you begin to uh, intrude in that space by creating a few interventions and you see changes and impacts from your interventions. And another perspective on when you have it and it begins to deteriorate. Uh, those are the two things, that, messages that I would like to leave you uh, uh, with. Uh, I hope you can see that. Uh, a lot of congested uh, and small handwriting, but if we see that, let, let me get it into, uh, uh, into it. Uh, with, the, with the assistance of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, uh, going back to 2006, uh, one of the things we started with was to uh, enact uh, legislation called the legal capacity of married persons. That was in 2006. And the purpose was to, uh, to rebalance the gender discrimination that was, was in the economy and also in access to uh, uh, finance. What, uh, so what we were doing was to introduce some uh, initiatives to begin to close the, uh, uh, the vacuum in regulatory uh, environment. Well, we, we have some uh, uh, impact studies now, and what we, we discover is that uh, lending to women uh, rose, and rose significantly. But at first, there were uh, several unintended consequences. Notably, before the enactment of the legislation, husbands could go to a bank and borrow money without consulting the, the wife. And we wanted to rebalance that such that wives could also do the the same, but more importantly, both should discuss, consult with each other, and uh, decide on how, how to, to proceed. Now, we wanted to reduce the uh, regulatory burden by saying that to the extent that husbands don't need to consult their wives, the wives should also enjoy the right of not consulting their husbands. But that's not exactly how the banks implemented it. What the banks did was, to say, okay, fine, now uh, we should also uh, demand that husbands uh, must also come with their wives. So instead of rolling back the, uh, uh, the burden, we had now uh, both having to be consulted. Then we had both of them coming to the bank, and that was more than what, what we had intended. And that sort of uh, uh, reduced uh, the lending that was there in the first place. We went in and started discussing with the banks, said, no, 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 that's not what we intended. 
After a while, they agreed and uh, it changed. And uh, credit extended to, uh, to women jumped from 26% uh, to, 30, to 33%. Later, we enacted the, uh, the, the, the Land Act, that was in 2010, and we also introduced a Land Administration Authority uh, with a, uh, a mandate to regularize ownership of land and uh, to assist people to uh, hold leases whenever they, they have land that, so that they could then use the, uh, the property rights that they have in their leases to negotiate financing with, with the bank. The results as of today, uh, lending jumped from uh, 33% to 58%. And in terms of uh, money, from 800 million back in 2010 to 5.5 .5 billion uh, today. So there has been a very significant increase in uh, credit extension uh, in Lesotho as a result of these two major changes, the legal capacity of married persons and the enactment of the Land Act, as well as the establishment of the uh, uh, land management or land administration uh, authority. Just those few nudges in regulatory and in closing a game in regulatory uh, vacuum has resulted in this very powerful uh, uh, impact. But we didn't stop there. We also uh, introduced uh, uh, the commercial court, alternative dispute resolution. But first we started with the commercial court. Introducing a commercial court in Lesotho is, is a, uh, a lesson of uh, how not to do it. Uh, it's a lesson uh, of you need to understand what your problem is. And you need to invest a lot of time to knowing whether, in fact, this is the problem. So prior to uh, uh, 2000, everybody was saying we need a commercial court because the normal court is very slow. We need a commercial court. So on, on May 2000, we established a commercial court. Three years later, they haven't had a single case. What is wrong? We went back. Oh, the judges don't understand commercial litigation. As a result, they are not taking any cases. OK, so let's train the judges. So we took the judges, took them to Uganda, and uh, trained them in the commercial litigation. And they came back, now they are wiser. Two years later, not a single case. What happened now? We went back, what's going on? Or oh, we discovered the advocates themselves don't understand commercial litigation, so they don't want to also bring cases to the uh, commercial court. So we then took them to, uh, to training. Mind you, now this is eight years <laughs> since, since enactment. We took them uh, to, uh, to this, and then we discovered now we have the judges and the advocates trained, but there's still no uh, litigation. What is wrong now? We discovered that uh, the, much, the commercial court was settling matters quickly, but advocates want to drag cases, and so they preferred the ordinary court because they they had a long-standing practice of, never, of cases never moving forward, and they didn't want to place their cases in there. So uh, with persuasion, finally, it started working. So as of today, uh, the uh, commercial court uh, hears about uh, 200 cases a, a year. And for a few years, it went fine. And then it's going wrong again. So what's going on now? Well. The cases are decided and decided very quickly. But uh, enforcement has collapsed. Why? Because there is also now rent seeking. And so the, uh, the, uh, the agents uh, for enforcement are taking bribes. And so, yeah. But we are, it's, uh, it's, it's 17 years now since we started. It's still a learning process. It's very interesting. Uh, how uh, you may misdiagnose and then perverse incentives develop uh, along the way.
it's a matter that we are, we'll continue to, uh, to look at it. Bottom line, the introduction of uh, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms has introduced a, uh, a change in uh, uh, settlement of commercial uh, disputes. We have a small claims court that we didn't have previously, and it has now had over 1,500 uh, cases. And people are beginning to find it. We haven't, we haven't made a lot of noise about it, but they are, not, they are discovering it by themselves. And uh, it has relieved the costs of uh, normal litigation, which are very high in, in, in Lesotho. And they can go to the court and get their dispute settled relatively cheaply without having to bring lawyers. Of course, advocates don't like this um, at all. Uh, we also have a, a, a court annex uh, mediation. The, uh, people are beginning to uh, understand how it works. So uh, the, uh, the number of cases uh, enrolled in the ordinary high court is now reducing because of this alternative uh, uh, services for uh, mediation and uh, settlement of uh, uh, disputes. Now, hey. Lesotho is a, uh, many of you probably know, don't know where it is, and we keep it that way <laughs> so that we can continue to do a lot of things uh, without you knowing, because then you would want to intervene. Uh, I, I'm now four months as Minister of Finance. Uh, I left Washington, I was executive director, as Stuart uh, indicated. I left in 2012. A few months later, I was minister of planning. Two years later, exactly, our government was, was, was uh, uh, lost power. I went to, into retirement for two and a half years, and then it was rudely interrupted uh, by the uh, four months ago. I am now a member of parliament, so I, I threw in my my head uh, when campaigning, and uh, I, I really trumped that these other people were trying to uh, compete with me. I'm back. But it's very strange that we have had three elections in five years. What is going on is what I call the great connivance between some political leaders in Lesotho and the army, and the collapse of our government. Uh, Two years in the running for a five-year term in 2014-2015 was as a, as a result of uh, skillful politicians manipulating the army top brass and working together to find uh, to pressurize us until we uh, we we collapsed. That's not new in Lesotho, uh, but uh, what was uh, 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 brilliant this time was that they. Uh, mounted a coup in August 2014 in a manner that it would never look like a coup. Uh, politicians were still at the front, but in fact the power had, had passed on to uh, uh, the army. Sadak came in and, and uh, only Sadak failed to uh, recognize it as a coup. The UN did, uh, the African Union issued a statement, but not, not Sadak. And as a result, then government uh, changed, but why? What led to the uh, um, the instability in 2014? This is the coming together of a few politicians who were really intent on stealing a lot of money, together with uh, a small clique in the army that was also interested in uh, uh, in this money, and the result was a. Uh, a process that finally led to a collapse of government. What has happened since then is uh, considerable impunity. Uh, none of uh, the soldiers who were involved in a coup has ever uh, answered any question with the police. Uh, the deputy prime minister then in our government was the one who, who uh, was stealing. He tried everything to avoid showing up in court he was asked to explain this consistent and unexplained deposit in cash in his account that occur on a daily basis. He then 
applied for a constitutional case in which he said the police had no right to ask where the money is coming from. That went for a year. It was concluded, no, you, have, you must in, tell us where you are getting the money from. But after our government fell in 2015, everything went away. Uh, by that time, the army had been involved in several killings. The civilian government ensured that the army would never answer, or at least elements of the army would never answer for those cases. Uh, but this pers persisted. Uh, finally, the international community began to realize, and under pressure, uh, the government uh, lost the vote of no confidence in March. We went for an election, and they were out. What has happened since then is, is now to, to begin the process of bringing back the rule of law. Uh, yesterday, the commander of the defense uh, of the defense force who had already who had recently left the uh, the force was arrested. Fifteen soldiers that were involved in murder, high treason, uh, have already been uh, arrested. The commissioner of police is is running in South Africa, but he will find a way of bringing him back. The deputy prime minister is, is in South Africa running as well. We, we will bring him back. The defense uh, minister is facing a case of. Uh, Meda, uh, he has uh, already been to see uh, a magistrate. But in the two and a half years this government was in power, working very hard to avoid going to court and to systematically undermine the judiciary, uh, we have experienced considerable economic st stagnation. Investors have simply said, Let's wait and wait these people out. We, there's no way we are putting our money in here. Consumers themselves have now uh, reacted by being extraordinarily careful in spending their own money. And so you have uh, an economy that has stagnated. And I come in as finance minister and pray that it, be, uh, it begins to uh, uh, reignite. We'll see. But let me, let me just finish off by... Uh, uh, one issue about is, is systematic undermining of uh, 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 yeah, the systems of democracy. There, we saw these uh, demonstrated by deployment of uh, uh, their own people. And once they assume those, those top jobs and then ensuring that they then also deploy party activists in, in government institutions. At the judiciary, we saw uh, army people coming hooded into court, uh, bringing people they call prisoners in chains into court, uh, and outright uh, threatening of um, judges. And then we observe judges beginning to make very strange uh, judgments. Uh, a, a chief justice that we appoint, appointed during our uh, government uh, began, well, and I must share with you that at, at some point it was possible to see which were the judges that were remaining on the course of rule of law and the course of justice, which were the ones where that were already making biased decisions. And consistently, we saw the chief justice now allocating cases to a group, depending on which side you were. Uh, these are the things that you, you, uh, you begin to see, and that go to the heart of uh, uh, beginning to undermine uh, the course of justice, and ultimately, uh, holding all economic agents back uh, because the uncertainty have, have disappeared. So nobody knows whether their actions will be, there will be a return for their actions. I, I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Do have time for a yes. few questions? Any questions, please? Very blunt commentary. It was fascinating. A uh, 
I, I, I hope it doesn't get too broadly distributed. <laughs> Actually, could... Uh... I see someone. Oh. Hello. Um, my name is Iola Anion. I'm cons a consultant. First, I want to thank you for your honesty and blunt um, assessment of what's happening in Lesotho. Um, you mentioned threatening, the threatening of judges. I also am curious, uh, what are some of the other ways that there, the institutions are being systematically, um, systemically, excuse me, undermined? And what do you think needs to happen in Lesotho um, in order to bring it back to a place of stability? Well, we, in, in the last few months, we, we have ad adopted a, uh, a, a policy decision to implement a far-reaching uh, reform process, uh, constitutional, political, uh, security sector, uh, and administrative uh, reforms. And uh, the judiciary, we have asked the judiciary to sit down and uh, offer the uh, suggestions on how uh, the judiciary can be protected. Uh, in their own assessment, this was a very difficult period, and uh, they concede to uh, feeling threatened. Uh, they uh, could not, in many instances, issue edicts against this particular commander. But uh, they agree now we need to complete the rim fence and protect them from uh, not only the army, but all politici politicians, including ourselves. Um, but we are also looking to strengthen uh, uh, the constitutions, but also institutions. So one of the things we are now doing is uh, reviewing legislation and strengthening uh, protections of, uh, of institutions from uh, uh, abusive uh, executive uh, power. So uh, by end of November, we're actually intending to issue a, uh, a reform roadmap that, roadmap that would then uh, outline our intentions going forward in, the, in, in, in across the entire spectrum of uh, uh, reforms. Yes, yes, sir. My name is Yaya Fenusi. I'm with United States of Africa 2017 Project Task Force. When you talk about rule of law, it is not just a legal concept. It is also a political value. And that's what has been missed for the last 55 years in Africa. It is a political value. And therefore, you have to get the people in Africa to accept it and internalize it. Because when I was growing up in Africa in the 50s and 60s, before I left in 1967, no government was interfering with a youth organization when we want to have permit to rally. They said, oh, no. said, listen, it is not the rule of the police or the government to enforce the constitution and rule of law, but it is the basic right and value of everybody in that country why I came from Sierra Leone, to enforce the rule of law. So there's the judicial ones, there's also the political value of the rule of law. And you all have to push the political value of the rule of law, and you'll see how it will be widespread in Africa. Good afternoon. I am Chinyar Ban, and I am an attorney with a government agency. And <clears throat> Before I started working, I spent a lot of time working in the judiciary f as a clerk for both um, judges that have uh, lifetime appointments and judges that have temporary appointments. And I'm wondering how you feel about term limits in the judiciary in Lesotho and if you think that would help. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a few years ago, we, the issue of the independence of the judiciary wasn't uh, a very big deal for us. 
uh, it is now. So one of the models that we are looking at is the Kenyan uh, model, which is, uh, has undergone a recent uh, uh, change. And they have introduced uh, uh, term limits uh, for judges. We, one, one of the uh, avenues in which uh, we try to uh, ensure independence was to, uh, uh, to grant an unlimited time. So a judge is a judge. Once appointed, he can never be fired so until uh, retirement or death. Yeah. But uh, we have also observed the fragility and vulnerability of people. And uh, we have had experiences that reflect sometimes individuals uh, have stayed too long in a job. And the sense that the job is never going to go away has a bearing on the productivity or the commitment for judges to write judgments. For example, we have a painful situations where in litigation, a, a judgment is not written down. So long as it's not written the, uh, no party can appeal that, that judgment. Uh, we see these things. So we think that perhaps term limits uh, should also have a bearing uh, or should, should, could be introduced uh, to deal with the, uh, the issue of um, endless uh, judicial contracts. Thank you. It's coming. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Uh, my name is uh, Geoffrey Kiriawide. I'm a Justice of the Court of Appeals of Uganda and former head of the Commercial Court uh, over there and actually played a big role in doing the training uh, of the and creation of the com uh, Commercial Court in Lesotho. You did? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little bit uh, unhappy about the, the developments there. I've lost track for some time. But I do recall one really overriding factor that led to the intervention for the creation of the commercial court and mechanisms that would help in improving doing business within the Sutu, uh, like the creation of the small claims, court and next mediation. All of these things were really supposed to be uh, drivers in dispute resolution so that ultimately uh, uh, doing business would be a lot better. Uh, you have mentioned some of the areas of resistance and that was anticipated. Uh, but one of the areas you have not spoken about was actually the court users. Because in many other countries, one of the drivers to support these reforms are the court users. The actual SMEs, the, the business community, they actually drive uh, the process. And I don't know what happened in the Sutu. Were these not part of the matrix that would have helped uh, to support those reforms? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's always a small well. You, you, you know. yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm very, I'm happy to, that you took part in the in, in the training, so take this as my uh, my feedback for uh, for what what happened. But yeah, but thank you very much for the uh, for the question. Um, to you mentioned uh, two stakeholders here. Uh, business in particular, business is very subdued in Lesotho. I have personally, as minister, said with them that look things are going astray, you're sitting here, you need to say something. Uh, something is going wrong with the political instability and it's showing up in your margins. Uh, stand up as, a, uh, as chambers of commerce and uh, uh, tell government that the direction you are taking is wrong and it is af affecting our business environment, and finally, the number of people that we can hire. Uh, but they have always vacillated. No, the chief executives will tell me, we don't think we can do it ourselves. Perhaps our chair chairpersons can do that. I went to the ex extraordinary 
uh, steps of, of actually writing some of the text they should, uh, uh, but it went no way. So there isn't much pressure coming from the uh, uh, business, at least not from an organized forum. Individual uh, businesses do continue to complain, but frankly, there isn't a, a cohesive voice uh, that speaks to the judiciary. There is, nonetheless, considerable complaining from the, the public. But that, that the, the complaint is directed to the politicians. But what is a politician to do uh, about the judiciary without being accused of interfering with the uh, judiciary? That has been extremely difficult. Uh, a courageous prime minister called uh, a chief justice in the past. The chief justice did, didn't like the message, and he let it be known that the prime minister is interfering with the, uh, the judiciary. So it's a very uh, strange uh, uh, situation that we find ourselves in. Nonetheless, I, uh, I see a lot of value. Ultimately, it is the uh, clients that must speak out, and, and I, uh, I welcome the, uh, the question very much. Yeah. I think we have, we have time for one more question before Dr. Majora needs to move along. Anything else? We can... Deidre, it's, it's on the way. Thank you, Dr. Majoro. You talked about the impact of the political instability on the court system, the institution of the rule of law. Were there other institutions that were impacted, um, whether it be you know, small businesses or academia? Uh, were some of those institutions able to maybe shore up things and create some sense of stability while the judiciary was under attack, uh, civil society groups, NGOs, how were they also affected by the, the instability? And is it possible to, I don't want to say, um, uh, uh, guard against that happening in the future by, I don't know, resilience, <laughs> strength, you know, strengthening those institutions so they have more resilience in the future? This was uh, the longest two and a half years I've ever <laughs> experienced in Lesotho. Uh, the, the strategy was first to polarize society. So uh, the, the popular refrain was, we are like water and, wa and oil. They can never come together. And this was used by the, uh, by the government then. Uh, and experiencing such extreme polarization, uh, the same set of facts could never be read the same. Uh, you could never experience something that is black, and we agree that it's black. Something that is white, and we agree that it's white. It then went into... Uh, nearly all, all institutions. So lecturers at the university began organizing around political parties and issuing conflicting statements. The law society split into two, a group pro-government, a group against uh, uh, what government was, uh, uh, was doing. Um, uh, media split into two, pro-government media, anti-government uh, media. Um, the regulator for the media, the Lesotho Communications Authority, uh, simply went quiet because it had to take uh, action against the, uh, the broadcasters, but it simply decided to go quiet. But in doing so, then allowing uh, uh, the some of the stations to continue with uh, polarizing uh, society. Uh, There's just a few examples of uh, how pervasive 
the uh, polarization and the intrusion and uh, the undermining of, of uh, institution uh, became uh, in Lesotho. Uh, one of the few institutions that survived, the, um, uh, the independent electoral of, office uh, survived. And uh, well, Sadak uh, to this day continue to mention that this is one organization uh, in Lesotho that you still find uh, uh, intact. And so uh, we looked at each other and across society, you are either with us or you're with them. So the governor of the central bank, I'm just making an example, the governor of the central bank, uh, we would decide, no, since they are still at work, they must be with them. Uh, trust in our institutions began to, uh, to falter. We are now in the process of trying to rebuild. We are, uh, um, before the end of November, we are hoping to hold a uh, multi-stakeholder uh, dialogue with all political parties and, and civil society to begin the, uh, a, a very slow process of healing. We still mistrust e each other. Uh, the, there's a member of the previous government who immediately after falling, he disappeared. He is in Washington. Uh, I, I know he wants to see me, uh, but in fact, <coughs> we are trying to avoid each other as well. But I have to be a, a big person, ultimately. <laughs> I'll see you. Well, okay. thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thank you, Dr. Majorum.